you found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's Silver and Black Today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back, Raider Nation. Welcome back, Las Vegas. This hot Sunday, of course, it's summertime, so it's always hot in Las Vegas. Our faces are melting off as usual but I'll take it over shoveling snow, folks, any day of the week. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there uh, and uh, to the families as well. Celebrating Dad um, on this Father's Day, of course. Uh, and we're going to – last week, it was it was crazy, shocking. Uh, we, we talked, of course, with Steve Delson, who's an author who wrote the uh, autobiography, co-wrote the autobiography of former Raiders defensive lineman John Matuzak, of course, who, who died of a drug overdose 30 years ago tomorrow – um, his mother, Audrey, called the show. She was listening and shared some really poignant memories of her son um, and uh, was thankful that we were touching on a lot of the positives that he had done because, uh, you know, life, uh, the, the world is full of negatives and um, of people attacking others. And, and we like to bring the stories uh, that, uh, that represent the entire person as well. And it's, it's one of those things I think underscores the point that unless you've walked in someone's shoes, you really don't know the path they're on. Uh, and today, um, we welcome former Raiders first round draft pick selected 24th overall by Al Davis in the 1991 draft. Of course, someone himself who's been walking a path, not many of us could understand, nor could he until recently. And that is Todd Marinovich. Todd, thanks for being with us here today on silver and black today. Right on. Great to be here, Scott. (laughs) All right, man. Well, uh, we certainly appreciate you taking the time and you know, I have to tell you, we before we you know dive into some of these subjects about you and your life, which I know um, uh, you you you're probably asked about a lot. We've had a lot of fans, a lot of Raider fans, message us over the course of the last year to talk about you and say, "Hey, what's going on with Todd?" And I think that's a testament to people wanting to see you live a good, happy, fulfilled life. Um, and and Raider Nation, I know you know you you had that brief time there. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. But you know, Raider Nation, a good or bad, they roll with you. And um, they might be the worst critics sometimes, but they also have lots of love for you. So I was, I was struck by that, and I'm, I'm glad you're able to um, spend some time with us. Now, they really want to know that journey, and we're going to d- dive into it, of course. But how are you doing at present time um, and, and, and everything that's going on in your life? Uh, how you feel about, about everything? Well, I loved your uh, transition from a Tuzak and into my segment. And, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think, uh, and then when you say the Raider nation, it, it comes from the top and it's, uh, Mark Davis carrying on the tradition that Al started. And at last year, he looked at me and said, Todd, once a Raider, always a Raider. Yeah, that's just not a slogan. It's uh, they live it. Yeah, they do. They do but, it. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I kind of really I went to my first uh, Raider reunion last year because, um, and it, if it wasn't for my roommate and uh, best friend with the Raiders at the time, Andrew Glover, encouraging me to go. Um, I was listening to my head that that nobody would want to see me, uh, you know, they roll their eyes, all all this fantasy. (laughs) fantasy, And it was one of the most incredible weekends of my life. Um, And now I'm part of it. I'll go every year. And... That's what it's moving to Vegas. I know it's crazy, and <laughs> and and that's the thing. You know, we 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 are um, we have been the, the Raiders are so active in this community already, um, Todd. And and you know, Vegas Vegas has all the vice, right? Everybody knows about that. But the community outside of that side of the city is pretty significant. It's grown. It's now almost two and a half million people here. And the Raiders already have 35 people. They're a year away from moving here. They have 35 people in their foundation. They're doing community work all the time. So we see a lot of those guys like you who played for the Raiders. And some of them, some of them played in training camp 
and and didn't make the team, you know, and they're back Correct. and they're accepted by Mark Davis and the organization once a Raider, always a Raider. Uh, and, and they really are appreciative. And it was great to see. I know you were out there last year, like signing autographs and all that kind of stuff. How was that reception from Raider fans when you went out there for the first time? Were you nervous about that at all? Um, yeah, uh, a little bit. I, I was more, I was more, I was really, uh, concerned with how team, you know, t- some teammates and past guys I didn't play with that were really legends. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was it was great. It was like, uh, and that's the thing that's amazing when you do get together um, with guys that you, that you played with. It, it's like no time had ever passed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing. I know I, hearing hearing guys um, like Howie Long and Marcus Allen, they have a big charity softball event here this coming uh, this coming week, or they had one this week, and and able to talk to Marcus and, and ask about, and he, he still talks glowingly about you, um, especially from a talent perspective and what you, what you were able to show. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the, everyone has kind of seen what happened over the course of your career. And of course your life, because you were under a microscope and, and sitting down and rereading that Michael Rosenberg piece, of course, from sports illustrated. Um, and if our listeners haven't read it, you should do that. You know, I found myself again, same age. I grew up in Southern California, so so the 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 persona and the legend that was Todd Marinovich, even at an early age when I was in high school at the same time, you know, reached all the way down to San Diego, as you know. Um, and as the story moved along, you know, I, I think I think I have the same point of view as these Raider fans have, which is, you know, I want you to do well. I want you to get to a good place face those issues that, you know, that, that, that got you to the point where you were with addiction and all those other things. And in that story, um, you know, you, Michael leads with this whole thing about the big lie, right? And the big lie had to do with you and your dad, Marvin, and his desire to mold you into this great athlete. Tell us what that lie was and how you finally came to grips with admitting to that and getting, at least getting to the point where you could start working, getting past it. Wow. It was, uh, well, first off, Michael uh, Rosenberg, who wrote it, I think did a fantastic job. Um, it's not easy to put all that together. Mm-hmm. And and it was um, just really something that uh, has come up um, as of late uh, in, in my recovery process. Right. And kind of wish... <laughs> I got to it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is what it is. And um, I just, uh, you know, as a, as a young child, um, you know, we put our trust in our, our parents. And I just bought, I bought in and I was all in uh, to my dad's ideas and not that I agreed, <laughs> agreed with them. Mm-hmm. I just, uh, like, like Michael wrote, I bought into the lie and it, it, it uh, it became my journey. Sure. And wouldn't change it. And, and the thing is, it sounds cliche. Wouldn't change a thing, but, uh, it's it's made you know it's made me who I am. Yeah, and 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 that's the thing too. Reading through it, um, Todd, it's uh, you know you relate. We all have different issues, different problems, different severity of issues, and so on. But you know, speaking myself, right? Uh, I had my issues growing up too, and and although they may be different than yours, you know, I could relate to 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 what you were talking about there because. I think we all go through life trying to figure out who it is we are, what it is we want to be, um, and and how that happens. And of course, your parents are that example, that first example. And you don't know too what training they had. You don't get training. I mean, you're a parent now too. You know this. No one yeah. gives you training. It's not like they say, "Okay, here's the playbook," right? Like you did when you were yeah. playing football. There's no playbook on how to raise a kid. So if yeah. if if you and your dad, if you if your dad didn't have a, a great um, upbringing, or if he had different issues, now I don't know much about your grandfather, but but 
the point is you don't know where what his background was, and you don't know it's what. So you, yes, it's generational. And yes, this stuff is just being passed, passed, passed. We could go on and so on and so on. So, the thing I do know is he did the best he could. Yes, with the with the information he had and wasn't, um, and which can be hard to swallow. Mm-hmm. Wasn't trying to hurt me. Right. In his mind, you know, in his mind. No, it, and it's so. You know, it, I think we're we're all um, sick to a degree. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all not in recovery, obviously. Um, but it's forced me to look at dark areas that are painful um, to get to experience. The after, yes, and um, that is is something that is um, hard to describe. That feeling, yeah, and we and we want to talk to you about that. We're going to um, step aside real quick here, Todd. When we come back, we'll continue uh, our conversation with Todd Marinovich on uh, where he's at, where he's been, and what he's learned. Most importantly, you're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 with our special guest, Todd Marinovich, former first-round draft pick of the uh, Los Angeles Raiders in 1991 and, of course, uh, star at USC. Uh, and uh, for folks like me who grew up in Southern California, someone you grew up hearing about constantly and, and knew who he was. Uh, and, and Todd, we, before we went to the break, we're talking about, um, you know, your recovery and getting to where you're at. Uh, and one of the things, too, that, that, that really hit home for me in reading um, Rosenberg's story from SI back in January was going back to those early years as a kid. You know, I have, I have four boys and a daughter. Um, they're always looking for my approval, affection, and attention. And for you, um, like you said, your, your dad did the best he could. It wasn't like he was trying to do anything to hurt you or anything like that. But the way that you were able to get that, you know, affection and love and attention from your dad was through this joint effort at the time, right, through sports. Why do you think it took so long for you to kind of realize how that had happened and how you'd been traumatized, and and how that led you to some of those very dark places that you've been throughout your life. Yeah, it, it, and you're dead on. It is uh, 100% um, childhood trauma. And I don't think uh, you can survive childhood, any of us, without experiencing some kind of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if it's like I experienced the physical, um, emotional, and verbal abuse. It uh, it stays with you, and, and I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand that, and there wasn't really a link uh, childhood trauma to addiction until kind of as of the last few years that mm-hmm. we're finding out, and and, and it, obviously hindsight, sure, it makes <laughs> it makes sense. But that wasn't what the, we were t- talking about um, early on in my early recovery attempts. So, um, and then it's where, you know, you're at as a person. And I've kind of thought a lot about, was this brought to my attention um, years ago? And I just wasn't ready to hear it. No. You know, and that that's a possibility. So, uh it's a, it's it's the journey and uh it's i'm still i'm still in it and what and will always be in it and it's, and it's uh something that i've you know, accepted yeah and 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 that I, I i i'm with you at that same same juncture which is all of life your experiences the pain the suffering all that stuff is part of who you are and builds you to a point and and, and you have to work through it to your point about trauma. Everybody has trauma in their life. 
different different ways, different people that 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 heap it upon them. Uh, but clearly, that's that's something. And, and one, I don't know if you've if you've read or heard about um, John Eldridge. He wrote a book called Wild at Heart. And in Wild at Heart, he, he called this thing that you experience. And and I'll be frank, me too, with with my own father in different ways. Is he calls it the father wound, and he says this father wound is something we like, all have. Yeah, we all have it, yeah. and it's passed yeah. on, like you said, generationally. Um, yeah. And and you know how your father raises you, they do the best that they can. That doesn't mean they're self aware. It doesn't mean they have the emotional intelligence to to do that. And so we have to learn generation by generation to get over yeah. that, so that we don't pass it on to our kids, or it gets yeah. better and better, right? Yes, without a doubt. You know, and I feel it with my own boy. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, that Baron turned ten uh, yesterday. Nice. Yeah, what a big deal! It's 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 uh, it's the coolest thing going for me. <laughs> That's great, <laughs> without a doubt. And I uh, I get to um, pass on through action. And I keep having to remind myself it's not the things that I say. He's watching what I do. Mm-hmm. And um, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done. And I love it. Yeah. And and, and talking about, you know, you, you, you finally, um, preparation for the interview, I went back and rewatched the, the 2005 documentary you did, the, the Marinovich Project with, with ESPN, um, and and seeing what you were saying then versus what you had said in the article this year, uh, and and you've kind of you're now at a place where you use the word abuse, right? With with your dad, mentally, physically, yes. Um, yes. was it fear all those years that prevented you from coming to grips with that? <laughs> you said it, Scott. Yeah, the big the big one, mm-hmm. and uh, and didn't even realize that I was uh, motivated by that, and uh, it ruled my life. Yeah. Fear. I was just I was scared. Still am. Uh, not as, you know, I, I'm, I'm a work in progress, um, but, uh, yeah, it's in, it's, it's in it's in the it's in the DNA almost it's ingrained. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's Well, and and Todd, we you know we the thing about fear, right, is we all have fears, and um, you know you hope that it's not of your dad, right, or that situation. In your case, it was, and and you're working through that, which is which is very encouraging. And but we all have it, right? And and I think the yeah. more, when you when you recognize it and you then approach dealing with it is when you start to heal. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, you're starting to get there, which is, which is fantastic. And for me, one of my opinions is as a dad in today's culture, uh, and this is where I talk about where, where, you know, you growing up under that, that microscope, um, I don't think we let kids be kids. We want to shuttle them from practice to practice, activity to activity, never let them find ways to entertain themselves. You know, you were on that program, uh, which of course, I mean, there was more articles written about your diet than I think your play at one time. Um, God, I know. Terrible. <laughs> and this frivolous and it was a lie. Yeah, it was a lie because you're. Yeah, I, I read that too. Your grandparents were giving you McDonald's and Oreos yeah. and stuff. Yeah, but that's a kid. You know, you 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 have to, as a father, you know, you prepare them for a, to 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 eventually be adults. But what 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 you need to do is you need to learn on your own. You learn through mistakes. You learn through imagination. You learn through playing um, around and just kind of being a kid. Um, should people look at your story as a way to learn how not to do it? Or, or is there, is there a mixed lesson? Is there some things they should look at that, that you and your dad were part of that were good that they should look at versus the things that are not? Hmm. I would never say what they should take from it. That's they're going to take what they're going to take. Right. Sure. Um, and there's, and there's, and there's a lot there. So, um, I, I, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's not easy as a parent and, uh, and I'm getting, how cool is it? I get to, um, experience this end of it of, yes, of course I want to protect them. And, uh, the thing is, I think I know what's best because I've lived it, right. but I don't know if that holds true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, I, 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 protect them if I see it 
you know, an easy one wandering out into the street, but I am not, I'm trying to really expose them to as much cool stuff as I know and, yeah. and let them, you know, decide. And, um, it's, uh, and then sports are a part of, I believe in them. I, I really do. I think mm-hmm. they're amazing. They can be amazing. Have we gotten off, uh, the path a little bit without a doubt? Um, but, it's the best thing going, I think, in our culture for kids because I've I've experienced it, and um, maybe I'm just not informed. Maybe there's more, but that's the route that they've. They're athletics, so they like to play. Most kids aren't, you know, like do the running, jumping, and and then when it becomes a team, that's why I really wanted a team sports. Are there's a magical quality when you all come together. It's great. So. It is, and it, it, it teaches kids, I think, uh, important skills about coping, getting along, working together. And that stuff you use not only in sports, but you work you use when you go to work. Uh, you, use, right. you use in your family. And so, so to me, I agree with you. I think, I think we've gotten off track. I think that this focus on kids playing one sport all year round, I played everything. I wasn't good in yeah. anything. <laughs> but we played everything, right? I mean, that was the point. Yeah. You're robbing them of an, a, a, a different experience in a in a way. Yeah. Um, now, if if the kid comes up with it himself, I'm just playing a one and yeah. because that's what I want to do. I get it. Yeah. But yeah. If they love a game so much that they want to focus on one, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Well, Todd, we're gonna we're gonna take another break. When we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about football and 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 your career and growing up playing the sport and how some people feel like maybe. You didn't love it, but you did uh, because of the involvement of your dad. So we'll, we'll dive into that here in just a second. Uh, we're talking to Todd Marinovich here on the Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio. 1140, don't go anywhere. There's more coming up. Hey, this is Tim Brown, Hall of Famer. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on Father's Day on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And Tim Brown brings us back in, and we're talking to Todd Marinovich. Todd, you threw a couple That's touchdown passes awesome. to Tim. <laughs> yeah, you just made me smile with that intro. Love, <laughs> love Timmy. What a player. Yes. What Best a, receiver. Yeah. And, and a good what guy, a too. Like I said, we, we've been around him That's, at cha- charity yeah. events. <laughs> but that's the thing, really. Uh, my experience is with great, I mean, great, great players. They were as equally as great off the field. Yeah. Which is amazing, but that's what I've experienced yeah. with all those guys. Oh, no doubt. And you, and you played with some great ones. Now, well, talking football a little bit, um, I think most of our listeners and Raiders fans know about your football career from the early age, of course, because it was well documented in every magazine, every newspaper through USC and then into the NFL. I mean, clearly we know and, and you know, you, you put in all that hard work, but you also have God given ability. H- how much, you know, how much did you I know you talk a lot about um, that you wanted to be you wanted to play. You're a competitive guy. Um, yep. And a lot of people mistake the stuff with your dad as you being forced to play, but you love the game, didn't you? Yeah, without a doubt. I think it's the greatest game on the, pl- on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the time that I spent, that's the thing. I, it, it, it taught me that there, there are no real shortcuts, and this is what – my dad just laid out that if you want to be uh, – really successful this is what successful people do and he related it to either gymnasts or swimmers um like olympic caliber ones they're doing it all day long right and and i believed it and so the three four five hours that i would put in i was getting a break so it's perception Mm -hmm. and that yeah and it's it's uh again so well documented uh all the work that you put in uh, and then the, the, the fruits of that labor, right, which was uh, your performances in high school, first at Modern Day and then Capistrano Valley, uh, and then on to USC, where, of course, your, your dad was also a star. Um, when, when, you, when you got to USC uh, and, and you, you were playing football, and, and the one thing that I did not know about you until recently was the, the, the artistic side, right, and that you got there and 
you were you were 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 having some trouble adjusting at USC, and then you 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 majored in art. Um, that USC experience, and of course, um, with Larry Smith and all that stuff that's well documented. Um, that was you were under so much pressure as a young kid, walking in there and start. I think you're the first starter. Uh, at USC uh, as a freshman since like 1941 or something like that. Um, that pressure, I mean, how how much pressure was it for you? And and how did it lead to, to you really not having a great relationship with the coach? And he did some, you know, I know Allie, who's uh, your girlfriend, your, 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 the mother of your kids, uh, his daughter, you, you're obviously uh, had a great relationship with her. But with Larry, you had a very mixed relationship. What was was that pressure on you on him that created that? Um, and how how is that where really the seeds of addiction and all that stuff started in earnest as far as actually using? Well, there's a lot it's a big there. question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We we could break it down a little by little. You can answer a part of it. You don't have to answer all of it. I just started. Yeah. I riffed. I riffed, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Um. Let's see. Well, the pressure at USC. Talk about that. Yeah, that that when I I just went back with, uh, a few years back, but they were honoring a couple teams of of the past, and so you get to see the current players without all the armor, right? right. Yeah. And I was the what was hand down for me. It was shocking how young they were, <laughs> and I just. It put in perspective, like, man, I was them. What I'm looking at, they're just, they're kids. They really are. They're young, they're young people mm-hmm. and really young to be in what everybody looks. It is, uh, it, it, it was staggering. Um, and it is, <laughs> it is, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, whether it's right, wrong, or, you know, that doesn't matter. It's just, uh, blew me away because I uh, I thought differently and uh, like I, I could handle uh, everything that goes with being a, uh, you know quarterback at a major university it's it's insane yeah uh, is what it is so it's a lot of to, pressure it's a lot of pressure and and Todd I mean I you you were in the media all the time now imagine I mean I look at kids today my daughter just graduated. Um, college. So, so my oldest just graduated college, which makes me feel really, really old. Wow. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like, oh man, the, the hairline's going back, everything. Uh, but, but when I, when I look at those kids today, Todd, if you were growing up today, even like you had been grown up and nothing changed, imagine YouTube, uh, Facebook, all this stuff, the kids have even more pressure, don't they? I mean, with all social media and all this digital stuff, they're constantly tracked from the moment they're 10, 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't imagine. No, no. And, uh, it just adds to, you know, the pressure of it all. So, um, but still the experience it, 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 it is, is where it's at. Uh, you know, how they handle it is another thing, but then they'll, Get an experience without a doubt. Oh, yeah. I encourage, and I encourage that. Yeah. Experience that. Yeah. No, it's, I think it's important. And, and again, we, we all go through what we need to go through. We make mistakes. We have triumphs. And, and that's all part of who we are. Now, you go yeah. from USC. And, of course, uh, right before you leave, uh, you had the legal trouble with the arrest, with cocaine possession, all that stuff. And so you slip in the, in the first round because of those issues and the persona that was out there about that you were that you were – uh, a troubled guy, uh, but Al Davis doesn't care if you're a troubled guy. If you can play, uh, if you have the ability yeah. to to play the game and help his team win, he was willing to give guys a chance. So they take you 24th in that first round. Talk about being drafted by the Raiders, uh, which basically your hometown, by the Raiders, and what it was like for you in dealing with Al Davis. Yeah, you know, looking at it, it probably wasn't the best situation because <laughs> I, I didn't leave the, the Coliseum. Yeah. You know, I was right there. But my uh, my friends and teammates were you know, right across town. I was 
in Manhattan Beach. And uh, so, I, but it, I would have imploded if I was in New York or <laughs> anywhere. So that setting was not really the issue. Um, but it was where I, it was where I wanted to play. I told I really I told my uh, agent at the time because it was really early in the morning, um, the draft, and I just said, wake me up when the Raiders are on the clock, and he did, and the <laughs> phone rang. Uh, it was, uh, I was just ecstatic. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, obviously things started well there in, when, you, when you came in for Jay Schrader and, and played, and, and that first game you had was, was phenomenal. Um, playing for the Raiders, and Al, so Al Davis was surveilling you during your time because of your off-the-field issues. Um, did how was that was the relationship with him then strained because he was always watching you or did you just get along with him and you just kind of you were doing what you were doing and so it was just part of the deal um our, our relationship was not uh it was it was un, well he said it to me it's unlike anyone i've had mm. uh with a player especially one this young only was it in two when he sat me down and it it was really out of his hands uh, as how he put it, because it was, I was violating the NFL drug policy. It wasn't Raider policy. I was violating. Right. right. Um, and he, he, you know, I was his boy. He, mm-hmm. he went out and picked me when nobody would. So, um, it was uh I carried that around for for two decades yeah. of that like I'd let him down, and I needed to amend that, and that's when I got to sit down with uh, Mark Davis well, that's... and he gave me the once a raider, always a raider and so um it's all about relationships I'm finding, and in this recovery a lifestyle it's really in life it's about relationships and i just really didn't i'm learning how i I just don't know really how yeah um and it's a learning gig and it's awesome it's not always easy (laughs) but it's what i'm finding it's worth those on the uncomfortability of it all yeah. to get to the other side to to, to feel the, the benefits like you know it, it relates to, to me work spending all those hours with my dad obviously if i'm spending all those hours and, and i'm not seeing any benefit that's no i'm out yeah it's, it's hard to stay motivated when you when you don't see a benefit right which is why so right. many people try to lose weight and then they fail because if it doesn't happen fast enough if you don't see the result then you kind of give up yeah. on that and and I mean and I agree you you have to nothing great comes from uh, ease nothing great no comes pain. yeah because I want to do stuff where there's no pain yeah well you know what <laughs> <laughs> that, you're not gonna like doing that stuff yeah no and that's what happens and but the the emotion the emotional stuff oh that's where I I want to avoid sure um, but it's uncomfortable yeah. I mean, yes. that to- totally get that. Um, Todd, we're going we're gonna to take one more break. I want to keep you for one more segment. When we come back, I want to talk about the now. I want to talk about your art, and I want to talk about the future. Okay? Yeah. All right. We're talking to Todd Marinovich, former Raider, former USC Trojan quarterback. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. All right, we're back talking to Todd Marinovich, former first round draft pick of the Raiders, and uh, we've we've gone through a lot of stuff uh, on Todd, his his life, his background, his career, and now we want to focus a little bit on now what he's doing now. And uh, I want you all to go to MarinovichArt.com, MarinovichArt.com where you can see some of Todd's work, his, his painting, uh, and all this stuff, which is phenomenal, man. And, and, and I think for you, um, the painting, it sounds like from, from reading, and I want to ask you, um, getting, getting back to something that you really love, which is art. You studied it in college. 
now you're doing it professionally for a while. Uh, how much is that helping with your recovery? Well, it's always been helping. I just wasn't aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the damn truth. I, um, I knew it really early, like my earliest uh, of school, that um, it's the only part that time was non-existent other than recess. Yeah. So I knew that being active playing, I love to do, and I don't think about anything else but that with sports and art. And uh, so I knew I, I knew it, it just became not the focus really quick. It wasn't like it was not allowed. It just wouldn't, that's not what we're focusing on. And it wasn't until uh, I just sparingly, you know, did it uh, over the years. And it wasn't until my son, uh, Baron, was born that I just said, I'm all in. I'm going to either do it and it's going to work out or not. (laughs) And it's the fear. There you go. Yeah. And I just said, let's do it. And it's been amazing. Really well, and it's. I mean, it, I get to paint, paint pictures. It's, it's it's awesome. Well, and it's it's. I mean, it's it's great stuff too. I mean, I was, you know, it's not. You're a talented guy, and I find that I don't care if you're physically talented, whatever it is, that usually talented people have multiple talents, right? So you had sports, of course, and you're able to paint. I know your dad was a, a sculptor. He could have been a, a very uh-huh. good sculptor, as you've said. Um, yeah. And so to see that work and to see the reflection of your love of the game, too, of football, um, you, uh, even even basketball. I know you have a, a cool portrait up on your website of, of Magic Johnson uh, and all of that. It, it really is uh, amazing stuff, and, and I hope that you continue to really to focus on it because um, you, know, you, you have the ability to do something that, that a lot of folks either have and can't reach or don't have. So, um, it's, it's good to see that you're able to, to tap into that and that it's helping you as well along this journey. Yeah. I love win wins <laughs> and art, art, art is that for me. For well, sure. and, and, and in the few minutes we have left with you, Todd, I know this last question before we, we let you go is, is sort of a tough one, but with all this stuff we talk about and you're very, like you said, in preparation for this interview and talking to you, you said, Hey, I'm an open book you know, nothing's off the table. I'm good with anything. Um, in the end, on your own time, <clears throat> one of the things I think that's important for any of us to get past wounds, to get past issues and trauma is eventually getting to the point where you can forgive. Um, is that, is that a journey you're still on, you know, with your dad? Again, it, he, he did his best, right? But you still yes. have to get to a point where you forgive him for not knowing these things weren't the best for you. Uh, and, and. Are you there yet? Are you getting closer? How do you feel about that? Oh, I, I'm there in that regard. I, it, if it's just not one thing, and then you're to the other side. I think it, I think it, it's ongoing, and forgiveness is, like you said, a huge one. There's a lot of also uh, where it's about me. Uh, not about him. Mm-hmm. There's grief, um, grieving, uh, not being able to have a childhood. That, um, but then you get into comparing of what is normal. What is the what? What is the normal <laughs> childhood? Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't no know. such thing. <laughs> uh, it's different for but, everybody, right? Yeah. So uh, it. It's expl- it's really exploring, and that's and sometimes it's exploring in art and in and in my uh, in my life and in in my past experiences is scary. But what I find, the, the more I do it, um, the better I feel, and it's not always easy. Um, and uh, the great part about it, I, I really I, I, I'm reflecting on things of my youth, and and then. I have uh, two beautiful children that are, I get to see how practicing what I would want it done to me with yeah. them and see how that works. And it's, it's 
it's really about practice. I'm practicing. That's right, man. And, that's, that's how we learn. Yeah. That's how yeah. we learn. Well, I, I can tell you, Todd, we're, we're all keeping positive thoughts for you here, and I know fans are as well. The journey you know, to enlightenment, a happy, healthy life is, is as we've talked about, it's sometimes a lonely one. Um, and there's some things we got to get to on our own, but I, I know Raider Nation is behind you. Uh, they're wanting you to succeed in life, in your art, and, and, and in feeling good about your life and, and where you're going and, and raising that family. And you always have a spot here. We hope we can catch up with you again soon to check in on your progress and more importantly, to see how your art's going. Uh, and we'll make sure we link up uh, marinovichart.com to our website. But, man, I, I just want to thank you. It's been, it's been great talking to you. And, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep in touch. And, and, and I appreciate how about, it. How, how about I come in yes. when uh, the Raiders are in their new home? A- absolutely. You know, a little in studio. That would be bitching. Yes, and hopefully we'll be out there at the, at the stadium, too. And, and that's the thing, too. I know... Uh, you'll be part of that, and we're just about a year away from it, man. And they're they're building their headquarters here, which is actually not far from my house. So we'll uh, wow. we'll do that. But yeah, we'll get we'll get you out here. And I just want to thank you again and wish you the best, man. And and we're here if you need anything. I you know what? Side note: I just did a a, a, a big painting for Mr. Davis. Oh, did you? Of the new, of the new stadium. Oh, that's so killer. I, yeah, I've been checking progress. It's an amazing, amazing building. Yeah, it's going to be cool. I can't wait to see your art. Todd Marinovich, thank you for joining us today, my man. Right on. Thanks for having me, Scott. All right, Todd. We'll talk to you soon. All right, that was Todd Marinovich. Great to catch up with him and uh, hear what he's up to. We're going to step aside. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. You found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's silver and black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to hour number two of silver and black today. Here on CBS Sports Radio 1140, part of the Happy Intercom family, of course. Uh, also, you can listen. I do another show, actually, about growth and, and, and the continued prosperity we're seeing in Las Vegas, including the stadium project. We usually do a stadium update over on 840 KXNT, News Talk 840 KXNT, um, right after this show. So from 10 to 11 a.m. on 840 a.m., which also streams at radio.com, uh, you can hear that show as well. So check it out. Uh, but, wow, what a first hour. Um, again, want to thank Todd Marinovich for joining us. And, uh, you know, for, for all of the things that have been written about Todd, and, and it's hard. I know people look at folks who have addiction issues and, and have had legal issues, getting arrested, all these things. And, and we tend to, and me included, we tend to be harsh. We say, hey, you know what? They don't learn. Here's a guy who's been doing this for 25 years over and over and over again. So I understand how people get callous about it. Uh, but if you – Todd's situation was so public, seeing his dad and all that stuff, and, and we all have our own family issues too. Uh, and so to relate to it and to understand – and here's a guy who's really trying to find it. You know, He's trying to find it. Um, he's a talented guy. Really check out his art, marinovichart.com. Good stuff. Uh, and we got, a, we got a scoop there that he's painting – the new stadium, a commission of the new stadium for Mark Davis, which is really cool. So, uh, but anyway, I'm pulling for Todd Marinovich. I know we, 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 uh, we're going to keep up and see where he's going. And um, the, the, the road is not always smooth, but uh, we certainly hope that Todd stays on the path and uh, raises that young family of his and gets to where he wants to go so that he's leading a good life. So thanks again to Todd Marinovich, the guest for the entire first hour. Uh, and now we're going to get into some some current Raider stuff. And just to know, uh, our, our my two co-hosts are very quiet. Well, they're very quiet because they're not here. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's up <laughs> with this, Scott? Mark Bonilla. What's our, up with this? Our Chaz Osborne, producer. Silver and Black, today. <laughs> See, where's that? I missed that. Chaz is on special assignment. So he's in the bathroom. At the, what is it, the U.S. Open? It, oh. What's up in uh, Monterey and uh, the golf tournament? So Chaz right. is up there on special assignment. For CBS Sports Radio and 40. We can't tell anybody what it is. No. 
But he's he just he's, did like twenty seconds. Well, do you remember? <laughs> do you remember the the Austin Powers movie, right? International Man of Mystery. Okay. Well, I called Ch- you know Chaz, longtime Laker scout. He traveled all over the country, all over the world. Chaz, I call the International Man of Leisure. <laughs> right. So he's out uh, on special leisure assignment. Leisure um, assignment. And, and whether or not he's wearing a leisure suit, that's a different story. Whoa. And then our, our other co-host, uh, our, our in-house NFL draft expert, Kelly Kreiner, uh, is under the weather on this Father's Day. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, he didn't make it today, and we he's, wish him the best. He's literally stuck in the corner. <laughs> he's, stuck, he's stuck in the corner, uh, and, and we hope that he feels better very, very soon uh, as he deals with his health issues. But that's why we're here, and that's why Mark's here. So you'll hear Mark come in, which is great. But we, we, we had mandatory minicamp this week for the Raiders. Uh, great attendance. A couple players not there with excuses. They said uh, nothing major, no issues. Um, but I want to play you some sound, especially from early uh, the first day of camp, just because I thought uh, it was more interesting and um, we can't do it all. But um, camp started, uh, a lot of interest. Of course, uh, we're going to talk about hard knocks a little later. Because, uh, because of course, it was announced that the Raiders will be on the fifteenth season of HBO's Hard Knocks, worst kept secret in the world. They were they were a poster child. The opportunity to be on Hard Knocks, you knew it was coming. The NFL actually selects the team, so we'll talk about that later. But when it came to mini camp, John Gruden uh, had a press conference first day, media availability, of course, and. You know, one of the questions was around, and, and he, he kicked off talking about uh, some specific players, but he also kind of gave, I think, what his, his initial opinion. And, of course, this is coach speak, but we want to play it for you. Um, and they asked him about the 2019 team. What's different this year? How does he feel coming into this mandatory minicamp in June versus last year? And here's what coach had to say. Well, we're, we're a better team, you know, on paper, and we're faster. We've uh, collected some some really good players, but uh, we got a lot to prove, and uh, time will tell. Indeed, time will tell. Uh, now, of course, he didn't say that they have one of the worst schedules in the NFL, toughest schedules in the NFL, uh, or that they're going to be on the road for five weeks. Because John Gruden, I you know, the one thing I can say about him, nobody's perfect, but he doesn't give excuses very often, if ever. So uh, I th- I think the fact that he says, yeah, we've added some of these big pieces. Now they lost pieces too, uh, but they certainly are a better team. There's no doubt about it. It's just unfortunate for them, I think, Raider Nation, that you have a better team, a much better team, when it's all said and done, but that schedule, it's just, you know, it's sort of like, hey, I just got this new engine in my car, Mark, so my car has the best engine you can buy. It's awesome, but my front wheels don't work, <laughs> right? I mean, you, you, the schedule is crazy, and and if you're a Raider fan, Mark, you want to be optimistic, but when you look at the schedule, it's kind of – but anything can happen, right? I mean, right. it's sports. Yeah. It's so we'll, we'll see what happens there. But he talked about adding all these new pieces, and he, he specifically said there, we are faster, right? And, of course, Antonio Brown has a lot to do with that, as does the improved wide receiver core. Uh, here's what Gruden had to say about his new wideouts. Well, we feel like we've added some, some receivers, no doubt. But uh, we, like I said, we lost some good receivers too. We lost Cooper. We lost Jordy Nelson and Seth Roberts. We lost all our receivers. So we have, we got a lot of work to do still to find our identity. Uh, what personnel grouping is going to be best for us? Is it three receivers? Is it two receivers? Is it one back or two backs or no backs? Uh, that's why we practiced a lot of different formations and, and, and plays throughout the last few months. And. Uh, I'm excited about all our personnel groupings, honestly. I love Gruden's inflections. It's just funny as heck. Anyway, but so wide receivers there, yes. What I find interesting, though, is he says we lost Cooper. We lost Nelson. You didn't lose them. You jettisoned them. Uh, I know it's, it's, uh, it's semantics, but nonetheless, uh, definitely a better group. And, and I think with Terrell Williams there, of course, with Antonio Brown, this, this group is going to have a real special – opportunity i think and we've talked about this on the show the last couple of weeks to be a really really good offense and a fast striking offense uh, an offense that can run the ball when it needs to uh, and establish uh, that that ground game so that you can open up the run game and 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 car haters be damned 
He's going to have a big – I really believe he's going to be, have a big year there. Uh, and, and to see those guys come in and, and be part of that offense, it's going to be really exciting. Now, the defense we'll have to talk about another time because the defense is improved as well, but the question will be how much are they improved? Is this going to be a situation where they're going to have to stay in games by scoring a, a lot because the defense is not there yet? Uh, but we'll see. I think the defense clearly was the focus of the draft. It's been the focus of free agent acquisitions with Vontez Perfect and others. Um, and so we'll see where that goes. But that offense has, I really believe that offense is going to be something special with one caveat. And that is, can the offensive line get back to where it once was with all the changes they've had? Uh, Kelechi Assembly's gone. Donald Penn is gone, right? Now you have, of course, the anchor, the man, Rodney Hudson, who, yes, deserves an extension, and we'll get one. Don't worry, Raider Nation. It's going to come. Give it time. Don't get, don't get so impatient. I've seen impatience out there with, with getting Rodney's side. You don't have to. Just wait. It'll happen. But on the line, the big gaping hole that they had was at left guard. Uh, they created it by trading assembly to the Jets. And then I believe the incognito signing, and, and Richie Incognito is now going to start at left guard next to sophomore um, left tackle Colton Miller, who still has a long way to go to develop to where he needs to be. But if you look at that, I think that was the intent all along. I think when they traded Assembly, they knew that they were going to go get Incognito. I just can't believe that they created that hole thinking they could just pick somebody up without having a plan. I don't think Mike Mayock and John Gruden do a lot without having a plan. I know it doesn't always seem like the plan makes sense because we're not inside, but I think that was the plan all along. And so they asked Gruden about the left guard position, about Richie Incognito, and if he fit in, and here's what he said. I like him. He's a uh, Pro Bowl left guard. Last time he strapped it on, he wasn't good. He was one of the best. And uh, we, we need to solidify that position. That was a sore spot last year. We played four different left guards, and it hurt us. You know, and uh, We had injuries, and we had more injuries, and we had some more. So uh, hopefully Richie um, finds his... Um, his stride here like he had a couple years ago because when he's right, he's one of the best in football. Well, there you go. Uh, personal issues uh, aside, and if Kelly was here, he would be talking about how the incognito signing was not a good one because of the locker room or because of the character issues. But clearly, I think so reading between a lot with John Gruden is reading between the lines. And, and yes, I'm guessing, and yes, I'm making assumptions. But reading between the lines there, I think that was the plan all along. The plan was to go get on incognito. I think they might have talked to him about it. Uh, but nonetheless, that's where it's going. So if that line can play like it should now, as it's been bolstered with him at left guard and Gabe Jackson on the right side and so on, then if they can hold up and do well in that schedule, uh, there could be a really, really big year for that entire offensive unit and be very exciting. Uh, so we'll see. Now, when we come back from this break, we're going to hear a little bit on the defense. Daryl Worley, uh, which Gruden uh, will tell us a little bit about him and why he might be an important cog in the machine this year. And then one of the players who's in a kind of prove-it year was not given his contract extension, his option year, and that's Carl Joseph. And we're going to hear from him about his new teammates, about not getting that contract extension or option, and where that might lead him. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. The only way to take Silver and Black today with you is with the Radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Indeed. If you don't have the Radio.com app, you're crazy. Nuts. Over the edge. Looney, go get the radio.com app. Trust me, you can bring it with you. We have a bunch of listeners uh, who talk about how they take us with them and walk the dog, which I don't know. Is that a good thing that they're walking the dog? It's, it's listening possible. To us? It's possible. I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, it distracts you from what your dog's peeing doing. on. Yeah. <laughs> now, are they picking cool. up? No, they just keep walking. They just keep, they just keep walking. Keep walking. Yeah. Oh. We have, have you, we have this app, right? So for our neighborhood, uh, we have a, a, a community association, and the community association has this app, this neighborhood app. 
and the people go on there. The biggest thing I see on there, first of all, I can't believe what people say to their neighbors. But second of all, they, that's the biggest thing people complain about is people not cleaning up after their dogs. Mm. And I have two dogs and always do it. Um, I just don't understand people who don't. Like, what? who do you think is going to pick that up? You need a branded silver and black today pooper scooper <laughs> is what you need. Yes, yes. With the Radio.com app attached to it. That's there what we go. need. Yes, a little little uh, earphone holder, right? So you can put your headphones on. All right, back to Raider football, back to mandatory minicamp this week in Alameda. And we're going to switch to a little bit of the defensive side of the ball now. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, Daryl Worley, of course, uh, Worley injured last year, but a guy that they brought in and really felt good about. It was a guy, Gruden, I think, one of those Gruden guys that he falls in love with. And so uh, Worley is coming back from the injury uh, to the shoulder, and uh, Gruden likes what he sees. I think Gruden likes him mostly because he perceives him as a tough guy. Like, he's just, he's one of those guys. Like, he's going to he's gonna lace him up and get out there. It doesn't matter if his shoulder's falling off. So here, uh, Gruden talking about Worley and his love for the player. I like Worley. Worley, her, his shoulder popped out of socket. I can still see Worley on the sideline trying to knock his shoulder back into place and keep playing. He's a tough guy. He's also had some adversity in his career, but I got a lot of, a lot of respect for the way a man can get up off the ground and dust himself off, given another opportunity, and that's what Incognito's doing, and that's what Worley's doing, and that's what the Raiders are here to help them. Yeah, there's there's John Gruden. I mean, yeah, he loves tough guys, right? So that's not a surprise. But he was channeling his inner Al Davis there as well, right? Which is this, hey, I want a guy to get off the ground, get a second chance. And he mentioned Incognito again, uh, even when talking about Daryl Worley. So so clearly he feels like this is a guy who's going to be able to do it for them. Um, they obviously drafted defensive backs as well, safety, um, and, and, and had free agent signings as well. So to me... If you look at what the Raiders are doing there uh, with Worley, he's a guy that they really are looking to. Whether or not it pans out and he wins that role, we'll see. It looks like he might. Uh, but Daryl Worley also spoke to the media. Uh, and, and one of the, the words, the key words you've been seeing, and, and organizations in the NFL are very good about this. They plant kind of narratives and words when they describe a player, and it's purposeful. So when, when a coach, doesn't matter if it's Gruden, if it's the uh, Gunther, if it's uh, an offensive coach, a position coach, uh, the PR guys, it doesn't matter. They're going to use a word to describe a player that the team wants to push along. And the word that you've been hearing with with Worley has been maturity, right? So a lot of questions, a lot of things around maturity with Daryl Worley. So when he talked to the press, they asked him, you know, how have you progressed working through an injury last year, not being able to play at times and 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 really – understanding what your role is on this team and what is expected of you in that complex system. And so here's Worley about how he has matured. Well, I mean, uh, just having another another year of life under my belt. Uh, it just, you, you, you continue to learn and get better. I mean, uh, and on the field and off the field. Um, I feel like on the field, just uh, being able to, to just be a guy that, that's reliable. I mean, as far as the coaches, my, my teammates, and just, just being everywhere that, that's expected of me. There you go. Daryl Worley talking about uh, immaturity. And, and it's true, life. You know, he, he talked about the first thing he said was experience in life. Uh, and so for him to talk about that is a big deal. And I think um, him playing at cornerback, of course, you have the young Nick Nelson, you have Trayvon Mullen, who they drafted, uh, and of course, uh, Gary on Conley as well back there. So, so we'll see what happens and what position he slots into uh, and, and if he wins out there. But certainly I think that uh, – Hearing from him and understanding that that he he understands what's expected. That's the first step, right? The, the, and and being, I don't think fans overall understood how complex that defensive scheme is, right? That Paul Gunther brought with him. Everybody was excited about it, and it took these guys a long time last year to to really get comfortable. It's not that you don't learn it; you learn it right away. You study. These guys study, but to execute it on the field is a different story. It takes a dedication. It takes a discipline and a familiarity that takes time. And so that's where they got with that. Now, when talking about the team, what was the difference last year versus this year and kind of the overall feeling around the team? Here's what Worley had to say about that. Um, I feel like it's, it's definitely uh, it's, it's way ahead of where it was last year. 
and I mean uh, from from the guys that we we had on the team last year that that, that we brought back in to the into the team uh, it's it's basically just all, all vibing off of, off of one another the additions that we we've had those guys I mean they we have we have some top notch players and I, I mean they they come in and, and they're they're taking on the role that that's expected of them as well and I mean it's all it's all gelling very well gelling very well there you go from Daryl Worley and that that's a good thing I mean. And it's awesome that you can dust yourself off and then just pop your shoulder back in and then go and play. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's like old school that, North Dallas forty. Yeah, like we were talking about John Matuzak last week. Just slam it into the table and bam, bam, there goes. Your, but the, that's a tough guy. So, so Daryl Worley clearly uh, is a Gruden grinder. He's the Mel Gibson of the Raiders football <laughs> that's team. That's right. It's great. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh, you're taking me back with that movie. Little Lethal Weapon, baby. Little Lethal Weapon. Yes. Uh, but but Worley again with that that defensive backfield um, and uh, with uh, safety Jonathan Abram of course out of Mississippi State who I have to be honest with you I'm eating my words on uh, I thought it was I wasn't as excited about him and people said I was crazy and they're probably right uh, about him but um, Carl Joseph who also plays safety who might be playing safety with Jonathan Abram or Jonathan Abram might unseat we'll see how it goes. But uh, Carl Joseph is a guy who our good friend Mo Moten over at Bleacher Report wrote about him being a guy who's got a lot to prove this year because last year the rookie contract, he was not given the extension that was official yesterday. So he's got to prove himself. He's got to come out and make the case for why uh, the Raiders should continue to stay with him, especially when you got the young buck out of Mississippi State and Jonathan Abram there as well. So we're going to see what happens there. But Joseph, you know, knows knows that there's a competition there and knows also that as a pro, you help your teammates around you get better, especially if they're a rookie. So they, they asked Carl Joseph about the progression and what his thoughts were on Jonathan Abram. Oh, uh, man, he's a great, great young, young guy, man. Um, what I'm really impressed by is just how he's been able to uh, get this defense down um, for a young guy to come in and, be able to understand all the stuff and rules in this defense that that's pretty impressive he's been doing a great job well there you go the review of jonathan abram from carl joseph looks like two thumbs up joseph also um talked about uh this year versus last year and and the differences in how it feels oh yeah for sure um i think it's 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 like night and day from from this time this around this year compared to last year for everybody that's in their second year um including me um, just being able to understand everything, the pre-snap adjustments that need to be um, dealt with, and uh, the pre-snap communication, I think we're on another level so far. Well, there it is. So he's feeling good about the mood as well. Also, as we close out uh, sound from minicamp, uh, Joseph, they asked him about the fact that his contract extension was not, or option wasn't exercised uh, as part of his last year of his rookie contract, which, you know, it could be a distraction for a player, um, it looks like Joseph, at least outwardly, is playing this the right way. I'm looking at just another season. I got to prove myself. I think, uh, you know, I don't think any year should be important more than another one. Um, I'm looking at another season. I got to prove myself, come in and prove myself and, and earn a starting job uh, and just get get better. Um, you know, so the contract stuff will handle itself. Obviously, I want to be here. I expressed that already. Uh, Coach Gruden and Mr. Mayock, I want to be already for life. Um, but at the end of the day, I got to take care of my business on the field. You know, I'm not focused on the contract. That stuff will take care of itself. All right. Well, we'll see if that's true on the field. I think it is. I think he's a genuine young guy, and he's going to focus because that's where you do. If you want to keep your job and you want to earn that next contract, that's what you got to do, right? So Carl Joseph, I know. I think Raider fans overall root for Carl Joseph. They've been frustrated by him in the past because of the progression but again, a second year in this defense with the coaching they have, I expect him to do pretty good. Whether or not he's back with the Raiders, I guess, could end up being a financial situation depending. But uh, I, I like the kid. I think he will do fine this year. All right. Well, when we come back from this break, usually we would do Kelly's corner, but Kelly is in a corner somewhere because he's ill. Nope, he's fired. He's fired. <laughs> I tweeted him. He can't come in. I knew he was going to talk about incognito. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, see, you know we, who needs to stay incognito? Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> we go from 
Tom Rinovich to the President of the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Gotta love me. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter. You love you, that's for sure. Okay, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about a debate Kelly and I had about the best running back in Raider history. We'll, say, we'll see what you had to say on Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Mark Bidane, president of the Raiders. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Indeed you are. Happy Father's Day. As I run solo on the show today for Father's Day. Yes, it's Father's Day. I have five kids. So That's I'm. they didn't show up. <laughs> it's Father's Day. Let's let him do it by himself. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, so we'll see. The international man of leisure, Chaz Osborne, is on assignment. Kelly Kreiner is out sick. But they will be back next week. All right. And by the way, yes, no video today. Uh, I didn't want to do it today. Cause- Jazz Osborne, Silver and Black, today. <laughs> Tell everybody what you have that slugged in the system as. Oh, it's, it's Jazz drunk. It has to be. <laughs> he has to be. Come on. He's not. He's just excitable, but it does sound like it. He's on a Red Bull and something. Oh, yes. I know that. Yes. Red Bull and something. Maybe, maybe a Twinkie. Maybe Too much Twinkie. the Twinkie defense, right? Remember that? Today. Yeah, now he's on something. Now he's really on something. <laughs> now he's, yeah, now he's got the Quaaludes out, whatever he's got going. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, back to Raiders football. Now, Kelly's not here to defend his ignorance, but <laughs> I'm going to have this debate, and we'll we'll pick it up again next week when he's back, too. But... We asked the question, and it's been bantied about many, many times over and over again, but we we wanted to do it here too, and that was, who is the best running back to ever wear the silver and black? Who is the best Raiders running back of all time? There's a list. I think it's a pretty short list. So let me tell you, before I tell you the argument uh, uh, Kelly and I got into, or I shouldn't say argument. That sounds terrible. It was a a fruitful discussion around our disagreement, Um, and... Uh, this is who we asked, and we asked you all on Twitter, uh, Marcus Allen, Mark Van Egan, Bo Jackson, and Kenny King. Now, some people are like, Kenny King, he ranks like 12th on the list, blah, blah, blah. doesn't matter. Kenny King uh, was a good running back, and so we threw him in there. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, anyway, this is how you all voted. Marcus Allen, 55%. We had Bo Jackson in second with 41%. Kenny King in third with 3%, and Mark Van Egan last with 2%, which is actually surprising because I think, I think that's just an age thing because Mark Van Egan was pretty, pretty studly back in the day. But anyhow, so Kelly and I were sitting having enjoying uh, a cigar, a handcrafted cigar, and we got in this discussion, and we said, hey, okay, Marcus Allen, because we started talking about Josh Jacobs and the running back situation for the Raiders this season. And that just led to the conversation like when you're talking football and you cover the Raiders and Kelly being the Raider fan, me being the objective talk show host, uh, we were talking about it and we said, okay, so who's who's the best ever? We just kind of looked at each other and Kelly did not bat an eye, did not bat an eye when he said Bo Jackson, no question. And I was like, no question. Are you insane? Because listen, Bo Jackson, one of my favorite players ever, okay? Baseball, football, an incredible athlete. Unfortunately, career cut short due to injury. That injury today, he probably would be back in four weeks. But nonetheless, he says Bo Jackson. I, I completely disagree, not, not just because of the short career, okay? Bo Jackson was a force. When Bo Jackson ran the ball, it was like the Kool-Aid man going through that wall. Like, nobody's going to stop him. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody was going to stop him. Of course, the famous game where he ran over Brian Bosworth in Seattle. Bosworth. Oh, sorry. He's got my radio voice going. Um, and so so Bo Jackson, amazing player, and I wish and everyone wishes he could have had a longer career in football because uh, he was amazing. Now, Bo Jackson, one-time Pro Bowl, went to the Pro Bowl one time, played in four seasons, Starting in 87, of course, that was a short season due to the strike. So gained 550 yards in half a season, right? Long of 91 yards in the 87 season. He had a touchdown of nine. In fact, he's the only player in Raider history to run over. He had three touchdowns of 88 yards or longer in his four years. Pretty insane. So when Bo got running downhill, 
Ain't nobody going to stop him. There was just nobody's going to stop him. He was a force. There's no doubt. Great player, incredible physical specimen. Love the guy's personality. Bo knows everything. We get it. Uh, and he only played in one playoff game. And, of course, that's the game he got injured against the Cincinnati Bengals in 1990. So when looking at Bo Jackson, it's hard to say that he's the best running back. Kelly said he was. No, I don't believe it because, look, potential, what if, could have, should have, that's all great when you're debating. But when you look at the numbers and you're deciding who is a better running back on the Raiders and in Raider history, it has to be Marcus Allen. Marcus Allen, Hall of Fame, six-time Pro Bowl, two-time All-Pro, won a Super Bowl, was an MVP, 1982 AP Offensive Rookie of the Year, 85 AP Offensive Rookie of the Year, Offensive Player Rookie of the Year, uh, uh, and also the Pro Football Writers Association 93 Comeback Player of the Year. Now, 11 years he played with the Raiders, okay? In 11 years with the Raiders, 8,545 yards. Wow. Just huge, okay? Not only that, but if you look at 1985... Of course, they won the Super Bowl in his second year in 1983. Uh, in 1985, he rushed for 1,759 yards, 109 yards per game average. Unbelievable. Not only that, he had 447 yards receiving and 2,300 yards from scrimmage. Okay, so Marcus Allen, I don't know why. He didn't have the blazing speed or the, the run-you-over ability that you saw with Bo Jackson. He was not as big, uh, as stocky, as built as Bo Jackson. Marcus was still tall. I mean, he was 6'2", 210 pounds when he played versus 6'1", 227 with Bo Jackson, right? So you're talking about almost 20 more pounds. But I don't know why Marcus, I know a lot of, I mean, don't get me wrong, Raider fans love Marcus Allen. They've always loved Marcus Allen. Of course, he went to finish his career at the Chiefs. He had no choice. Al Davis uh, in one of his his rare um, uh, situations where he didn't show, I believe, loyalty to Marcus Allen because they got in some disagreement. We don't know what, why. There's all kinds of theories about it. But he got sent to Kansas City. He went to Kansas City. And But if you look at Marcus Allen, okay, unbelievable player. I think perhaps one of the best running backs, if not the best or top three running backs in the history of football. Of course, Jim Brown, to me, will always be number one, and then you have Walter Payton, number two. But I think Marcus Allen, number three. There's a lot of other great guys. I know you're going to at me with all this stuff, and that's fine. But I'm just telling you, Marcus Allen, best Raider running back, top three in my world, and in my opinion, in NFL history. The numbers speak for themselves. When you look at not only did he run the ball, but he had an elusiveness. He could run and catch in traffic. He could throw the ball. Remember, he played quarterback at Lincoln High School in San Diego. So the guy could do everything. He was just an amazing athlete. And so when you look at that from a Raider perspective, you have to say Marcus Allen was the best. Now, we'll, we'll rehash this a little bit when we have Kelly back on the show, uh, when he gets over his, his malaise. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I, I think it's, it's a discussion. This time of the year, you know, we have these um, – discussions about former Raider players and, and, and where they rank. So Marcus Allen, Bo Jackson, and Mark Van Egan. I mean, I, Mark Van Egan, I don't know, for the, for the younger folks out there, um, I don't, you, you need to search and, and look at Raiders history and look at Mark Van Egan because Mark Van Egan was a stud. This guy played from 74 to 81, okay? You're talking 223 pounds, uh, running back, went to school at Colgate. He finished his career with the Patriots, but he won two Super Bowls with the Raiders, obviously. And uh, But this guy was a bruising, bruising running back and just did amazing things for the Raiders. Again, uh, 37 touchdowns in the course of his career, 6,600 yards. Of course, a different kind of running back at a different time than Marcus Allen or Bo Jackson. Uh, but Raider history has you know great running backs, and so so that's that's my case for Marcus Allen. I mean, again, the numbers speak for themselves, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, not only again was he the best Raiders running back in the history of the franchise, but he was the best running back, top three running back in the history of the NFL. And in Kansas City, even if you look what he did in Kansas City, I know that's a sore spot for Raider fans. But his last year in the league, eleven touchdowns. Just 500 yards, but he really 
uh, finished well there. And, and outside of, what, Christian Okoye maybe, probably the best running back in Kansas City Chief history, or one of them at least, uh, and he was there just five years. So that's it. Kelly, if you're listening at home, nursing yourself, you're wrong. Marcus Allen is the best running back. But we'll hear his side of the story when he gets his tail back in the studio. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, well, we are going to head uh, to a break now. When we come back, we're going to talk about hard knocks, right? The big announcement. I don't know why everybody's so excited. I'm a little tepid on it, but we will talk about that and what it means for the Raiders overall. And also, we'll talk and tease you a little bit on what we're going to have for you next week here on Silver and Black today because we don't stop. It doesn't matter. Off-season, there is no off-season. We are here to bring you the latest on Raider football, the future Las Vegas Raiders, of course. All right, we'll step aside. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio on this beautiful Father's Day in Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada. If you're outside the state, don't ever call it Nevada. My daughter did that once. Ivanka was horrible. I'm like, I need to sit down to talk to her. I'm not going to get any votes. <laughs> and he lost the, you lost the state, and I Mr. lost President. the damn state <laughs> to that troll. <laughs> Mark Vanilla, ladies and gentlemen, our executive producer, with the impression you got like that. But happy Father's Day. And uh, did you get your dad a Raiders-related gift? And what was it? I'd be interested. Tweet at us. Let us know if you did. I'd be interested to hear uh, what you got. Uh, but it's all about showing appreciation for fathers in your life. Uh, if you don't, if you, if you lost your father... Uh, or if your uncle raised you or your grandfather raised you, uh, that father figure important in everybody's life. So happy Father's Day to everyone out there in Raider Nation. All right, hard knocks. I don't get it. I don't know why people are so excited about this because, first of all, I am not a big TV guy, period, but I'm also not a big uh, reality TV guy. Like, I, I mean, if they had real radio and they had the lives of radio people on reality television, Mark, and you were the star, I might watch it. Yeah, I hardly doubt that. <laughs> but there's there's a difference. There's there's uh regular reality television like Big and then Brother there's and stuff like fake that. Fake reality. Well no, well, I don't even guy can't even go down the line of Big Brother. I almost fear that. But like isn't it all sort of, of fake in that? Well they make it interesting. I mean, I think like where you have a hospital where you're in an emergency room and they're just there shooting what happens on a daily basis. I think that's reality. That's television, reality. Right? Because people are dying. Correct. Or and, not. Or not. Right. Uh, and so you but see But you that. don't see that you, you, you wouldn't like the, the realisticness of football camp and what, you know. Well, here's my problem. Okay. And that is I just don't think – I don't – I don't understand fans, and I'm trying to go back to when I was fanatical. I grew up a Chargers fan, uh -huh. which some of the people who listen to the show can't get over. But, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I gave that up a while ago, a long mm -hmm. time ago. And so I'm, I'm a fan of the sport more mm -hmm. than a team. I want the Raiders to do well because they're coming to Las Vegas. But nonetheless, I don't understand why people want validation of their team and their fanhood by having their team highlighted on a show – that's five episodes. I mean, I get it. It's more content for them to consume. I want to know more about my team. I want to know the inside workings. I get that piece of it. I just think it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Okay. Um, but going back to 2001, when Hard Knocks first came out, that first season with the Baltimore Ravens, fascinating. I watched it. I think I watched it for the first two or three seasons. And then I just kind of was like, meh. You know, when you start putting the Cincinnati Bengals on, and you say, it just wasn't that. Like, Dallas Cowboys, who I hate. So it wasn't going to be something long-term that I liked. But for the Raiders, now, uh, Mark, only the second AFC West team to be on the show in 15 seasons. Wow. Actually, 14 seasons. They skipped a season. Oh. <laughs> um, oh we're on 15? 
<laughs> yes, they call it season 15, but season... Oh, f- did they black out 13? <laughs> <laughs> like the hotels? Yeah, you can't go to the 13th floor. Uh, it was season 11. There was, there, was, there was talk of a maybe a work stoppage, so they didn't do it that year. Oh. But um, this show is, I mean, to me, uh, here's the good side. Let me get to the positive because I don't want people to think I'm just hating on it. From a brand perspective, as someone who's done brand marketing for a long time, the Raiders brand is strong. It's international. To get out there and put it on the show is good as long as things don't take any crazy unexpected turns, which can happen unless they hide it, of course, because it's a produced show. Reality, and I'm, I'm doing the quote things with my fingers. Now, well, you can all see that, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I just think that with this Raider team, uh, I thought for sure it would be next year because they'll be in Vegas. But I can also understand the storylines of they're moving here. They're leaving Oakland after being there twice. Um, and so, so that storyline to me will be actually, if I watch it, that's what I'll be looking for. The players on the field, who's going to make the team and all that stuff. We keep up with it so much that I, I think I'll kind of know what's going on there. But to me, it'll be that. It'll be the transitioning from one city to another. That'll be fascinating right? to me. But we'll see. Now, they didn't have a choice. I don't, I don't people think, well, oh, I hope they're on. Well, no, the NFL chooses who's on. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think this is part of the deal when the Raiders agreed to do all these international games, that was part of the deal to allow them to move here. So it's like, you know, my cousin Vinny comes around and he wants his VIG because I owe him. I bet that game the other way. This is what they're doing. The NFL basically said, look, guys, we're going to put you on hard knocks and you're going to have to suck it up. So I don't know whether or not the Raiders want to do it. I know fans are very excited about it. So I'm going to respect that, that the fans out there have spoken for the most part, although there's, there's a small contingent of folks that I tend to run with on Twitter <laughs> who, who aren't excited about it. But for the fans, it's great, and I'm sure it will do well. And it'll be interesting to see how that all unfolds. I'll be fascinated. I think it's going to be the John Gruden, Mike Mayock show. I don't think the players will. <laughs> there's no highlights of no. the players at all. No, there'll be some in there, of course. And, and I think the Derek Carr underlying theme about, well, he's got to have a big year. I think that'll sneak in a little bit. They'll play that up because it's dramatic. Uh, but it should be interesting. Those two will you watch it? Those two will be in a room. They'll be looking at each other face to face. There'll be a TV there and they'll be going over plays. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, wait. wait we that did was that something already. else. Yeah. Are you, are you going to watch, Mark? I don't have HBO. Oh, okay. I, I, I have a lot of people saying that they're now going to subscribe because of it. Oh, okay. But then you're subscribing well, a lot of for people, one month. A lot of people cancel their subscription after Game of Thrones. Yes. That's a great point. That's right. that, a lot of people have said that, so too. That's how they're going to get them back. <laughs> if they're Raiders Silver fans. and black will get them back. Oh. Ooh. You can't have it. It's mine. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark is looking for a job at Hallmark. No, um, I'm not. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh but no, it'll be interesting. Hard Knocks uh, starts on August 6th, five episodes, 10 to 11 p.m. Pacific time for the Raiders. Uh, of course, a similar situation, 2016, the Rams were on as they moved back to L.A. They already moved back, but uh, that should be interesting. But Derek Carr, Antonio Brown, the young draft picks, all will be a big part of that, I am sure. So, And just a little preview of next week. We spent time with uh, some Raiders you may know, including one I talked about earlier, Marcus Allen, Maurice Hurst, uh, Brandon Marshall, at the charity softball game for the Golden Knights this weekend. And we're going to bring you that next week as we ask them some questions about their current team, of course, the current players. And then we talked to Marcus Allen about uh, a multitude of subjects. So we will bring that to you next week as as, as, as well as the latest news and information. And we will have some guests, too. We want to first thank Todd Marinovich for spending so much time with us, and we wish him the best. We're all cheering for you, my man, and uh, we appreciate him being here on the show and delving deep into his history, his life, and his battles with addiction and what lies ahead for him as the artist, Todd Marinovich. So thank you to him. Thank you to Mark Bonilla, our executive producer and engineer today. And I thank want you. to thank Kelly and Chaz for not showing up. <laughs> You got you got more airtime today. Jeez. <laughs> That's right. For Kelly Kreiner, who's out sick. For Chaz Osborne, the international man of leisure. I am Scott Goldbranson. You have been listening to the Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio. Visit silverandblacktoday.com. We'll talk to you next week. Take care, everybody.